So hello again. Uh, let's begin. We are all here. Um, I think we will have a chance to have a quick uh, technical check um, during everyone's speaking. Uh, today, this spaces is co-hosted with our friends from Brains and Slash Pool. Uh, big shout out to Slash Pool and Brains. And um, before we start, I would like to introduce our today's guests. Um, it's Pavel Rusnak, also known as uh, Stick, co-founder of uh, Satoshi Labs and creator of Trezor. Hi, Pavel. Hi, everyone. Uh, we also have here Josef Tetek, um, brand ambassador for Trezor and economist. Hi, Josef. Hi, good evening. Good evening. On uh, Brains and Slash Pool site, I'm happy to present Pavel Moravets, co-founder of, of Brains uh, and one of the early uh, earlier de early developers of Slash Pool. Hi, Pavel. Nice to have you here. Hello, everybody. Uh, thanks for having me. And Daniel Fromken, uh, tech writer for Brains and Slash Pool. How then? How hi, Daniel. Nice to meet you. Hi, everybody. Likewise. So today's topic is uh, Taproot. Uh, although I believe that almost all listeners are aware of what a Taproot is uh, for their start, yet uh, let's sort out the terms and maybe begin with uh, the basic question. What is Taproot? And I'm shooting it to the air. Uh, feel free to have a response, everyone. So maybe I'll start. Uh, so Taproot is the second uh, upgrade related to SegWit on the Bitcoin network. And SegWit uh, is basically a series of updates that we can do on, uh, on the Bitcoin network uh, without uh, doing a hard fork, which creates a lot of, a lot of issues uh, within the network and uh, drags in a lot of, lot of politics. And four years ago, we had uh, SegWit uh, version zero. It's uh, zero because uh, the developers really like to start uh, numbering uh, things from zero. And after four years, we have another upgrade, which is uh, SegWit version one, and uh, it has named uh, Taproot. Feel free to add uh, anything from your perspective, guys. No, I think uh, from my perspective, Taproot is is an awesome trick uh, which developers, uh, Gregory Maxwell namely, uh, find out how to uh, very clever way uh, organize uh, uh, Bitcoin script to put very nice features uh, to the language of, uh, let's say, Bitcoin scripting. So in very short terms, it's a clever trick in scripting of Bitcoin. Yes, I would add uh, that with Taproot, we have Schnorr signatures finally being implemented into Bitcoin, uh, which is something that uh, developers have been calling for for more than five years now. And with Schnorr signatures, uh, we have the ability to perform linear mathematical operations with signatures and public keys so that uh, we can actually save up some block space and uh, enjoy more privacy in complex transactions such as multi six or lightning network channel openings and closes. Thank you for the detailed, um, detailed explanation of what the taproot is in the essence. Uh, but before we go uh, too deep into details, um, I wanted to give a word to Pavel and Daniel to uh, present brains and slash pool because I think uh, some of our listeners uh, might not be too deep, uh, deeply involved into the mining scene, and uh, they will therefore they will be very interested in uh, knowing you better. Can you can you give us a brief brief introduction? Introduction. Sorry. Yeah, of course, uh, I don't want to talk about uh, us too long, but it's it's funny story. We created brains in two thousand eleven. Uh, I was a friend with Marek Patno Slash uh, for a lot of years uh, from childhood. Uh, but we created Brains with uh, uh, co-founder uh, Jan Čapek. 
and we originally didn't do anything with Bitcoin. It, everything changed in 2013 when we basically agreed with uh, Marek to develop and uh, run a slush pool together because it was uh, not possible basically to do it as a single man show. Uh, and it, it created a space for uh, guys to create Satoshi Labs. And I remember uh, how they uh, created their first uh, their first stuff and, and when they co-hosted in the same uh, office space was fun time and that uh, it's a lot of years and we have very good, great memories to, to the point. Uh, so yeah, and, and then we basically uh, did uh, go in our direction uh, more or less in the parallel to Schlapps, uh, focusing more on, on uh, Bitcoin mining and uh, always keeping uh, touch with uh, guys from Soto Schlapps about uh, stuff, about hardware wallets and, and things like that. And it's awesome that uh, Soto Schlapps is, and, and other companies uh, uh, the guys co-created uh, are so successful and we can uh, share the the history with them. We're happy yeah. to. Sorry, sorry, then. Go on. No, it's okay. Go ahead. No, you go ahead. I was just going to add that a little bit more on like the stuff going on in the mining industry recently and, and over time. Uh, Slush Pool has historically been the largest mining pool outside of China. And I guess at for a lot of time, the only real mining pool outside of China, at least of, of any noteworthy size. Um, now there's some new mining pools have emerged in North America and, and Japan. There's one and uh, some other places around the world. So we're getting more geographic diversity now of mining pools. But um, I think being the largest pool outside of China historically has put us in an important position of, of kind of being very involved with the Bitcoin ecosystem because I think the Chinese pools were kind of sequestered and um, not keeping up with what's going on, for example, on Twitter and just in general, the Western world. Um, so I think we've, we've been around for uh, some pivotal moments in Bitcoin history. And uh, yeah, the mining industry is a really, really interesting place to be. It is indeed. And uh, you guys were the first miners who signaled the support of Seprot. Um, I remember that precisely. And you were, uh, in general, supportive of this upgrade far before it became a mainstream topic. Maybe you can elaborate on your story. Uh, and if you are, were you involved in the development of Taproot? And if, if so, how deeply were you involved? I don't think we were directly uh, involved in developing Taproot. I do remember hearing about it. Uh, quite early because of reading uh, e uh, mailing list of uh, uh, Bitcoin developer uh, group, let's say. Uh, so I was uh, fascinated by the idea from the very beginning, but as everything in Bitcoin, what uh, would needs to be programmed uh, in Bitcoin D, it did take a lot of time and a lot of effort. Uh, before matura maturation, so uh, it was a long years of basically waiting when the the low level core critical stuff uh, would be ready, and once it was possible to anyhow support it publicly by, uh, as you mentioned, uh, starting to uh, to signal that we are ready and we support the the upgrade, we we did it, uh, but we unfortunately don't have the expertise of. Uh, like programming this low-level uh, Bitcoin related stuff, uh, so we didn't uh, put our effort into this part. But at least uh, helping as a as a miner, uh, it worked, and I think uh, it was a very successful uh, signaling period. I I want to add a little bit to it. I I think the guys and especially Pavel Pavel are quite modest in that. Uh, I, it has been said we were sharing uh, office spaces uh, at the beginning, and I remember the guys were always about uh, technology. It might sound like like a cliche, but they were really uh, following the development on Bitcoin and discussing a lot of a lot of things happening there and discussing uh, upgrades. So, uh, yeah, they were uh, involved also not directly in coding, but uh, 
I th think that's quite quite uh, rare to see uh, to be the C CEO of, CEOs of uh, pool uh, be so uh, technologically interested in, uh, in Bitcoin and its mining future. So, yeah, uh, kudos to that. Absolutely, kudos, um, and thank you, thank you, Pavel, for uh, for um, uh, thank you, Pavel, for a short uh, history, a history brief, and Pavel uh, for adding this input. I I agree. Um, I also think the guys are too modest, um, at least at least on that. Um, maybe let's move back to the taproot, and before we do it, I just want to do a quick PSA for um, everybody who join us and, and listen to this spaces. Uh, we are recording it, uh, so and as it's, it shouldn't impact anyhow uh, any process. It's just for uh, for later references for those who would like to uh, listen to it again or who will miss the the, the talk uh, for them to be able to uh, check out what was going on. Um, and uh, also, we are we're setting this discussion to be a friendly one and open. Uh, we have a, um, quite a few questions uh, to throw in the bowl, uh, and I encourage our listeners to hop on this talk um, and um, uh, and uh, <coughs> sorry, uh, hop, hop on the talk and ask uh, ask questions or bring some comments. Uh, feel free. Maybe later on, uh, I will reserve some space for. Uh, our questions, uh, and then we can make it, make it open. Uh, so go, going back to Taproot, uh, maybe let's start with uh, the most crucial advantages. Uh, what's what's the most crucial advantage Taproot gives to miners, and that on that on that on that level in the in the initial stage where it's when it's activated and it's an early adoption, and possibly in the future. So. It's, it's actually kind of the opposite case for miners because the advantage of Taproot for users is, at least one of them, is the fact that you can do more complex transactions without taking up more block space to do them. And for miners, the result of that is lower fees. Uh, so assuming that, that there's not higher demand coming elsewhere and maybe we're not filling blocks, which in, in recent months, the transaction fees have been pretty low for miners. Um, that, that means that there are more transactions which previously before Taproot would have been paying us higher fees in order to be included in blocks, which now will be paying lower fees, which is good for users and uh, from a business perspective, not so good for miners. Um, but what I would say to counter out that, that on my own point is that um, Taproot is being good for, uh, good for Bitcoin users means that it makes Bitcoin uh, more higher utility overall and more valuable overall. And ultimately, miners are very much long Bitcoin. Uh, we're heavily invested in the space and um, with, in the case of uh, physical mining operations, with uh, easy to liquidate. So for uh, anything that's good for Bitcoin price long term, as Taproot, I think, is in terms of making it more useful, is ultimately... Uh, good for mining revenue long term, even though the uh, the more direct impact is actually um, potentially decreasing our transaction fee revenue. But I don't think that there there was any miner in the world thinking about the decrease of uh, this revenue uh, when uh, deciding about signaling or not signaling. Uh, I think the general consensus even among uh, miners was it is a good thing for Bitcoin and nobody uh, took the short-term uh, money disadvantage as, as a significant one. So, but it is technically negative. It, it's funny because uh, everybody uh, speaks about Taproot in like all positives most. Uh, and this is a funny fact that uh, for miners it is a slight disadvantage, but nobody cares basically. Yeah, we didn't have anybody coming to us telling us not to support it. I think that really shows how the Bitcoin community is mature because you basically were supporting uh, something uh, from its uh, beginning uh, and you supported something that was not uh, 
benefit uh, in the short term, but you were caring also about the long term benefits of upgrade. And by you, I don't mean only brains and slash pool, but the whole Bitcoin uh, Bitcoin community. So this is great. And when some of you follow a uh, discussion about uh, mining in some altcoins, there is a lot of uh, a lot of uh, arguing uh, when it comes to decreasing fees uh, on some chains and the miners are not really happy about it but uh, you are able to see the the big picture of things and that's really great yeah and to bounce it to bound the same question to maybe to you pavel um and and joseph of course too uh what are the main uh, and crucial advantages that taproot brings to harbor wallets and harbor wallet users I think I will start, and then uh, Josef, feel free to add uh, to uh, to what I have said, what I what I will say. Uh, for hardware wallets uh, and Trezor, especially uh, Taproot was very important upgrade because it allowed us to fix uh, one uh, issue that uh, hasn't been uh, fixed for quite a long time. And the issue with the hardware wallets is that if you are If you are spending a transaction and you are basically spending some uh, some outputs, but the host, uh, in our case the computer or phone, has to tell you what is the input amount uh, you are spending because that's not uh, stored in the signing data. And what we have uh, done earlier was that we were asking the host to provide the whole uh, transaction, uh, what uh, you are spending. So Trezor could uh, verify that the provided amount is correct. And uh, Segwit version zero, that uh, upgrade that happened four years ago, tried to address it by adding an amount to input. Uh, and by adding, I mean that the signature of the input was committing to the amount of the input as well, which uh, was supposed to, con uh, to to block the a simple attack when an attacker just simply lies you about the amount of uh, input you are spending. And this is uh, important because if an attacker is able to lie about that, You can pay a really high fee and the attacker can steal it uh, from you that way. And as I've said, the Segwit tried to fix that, but there were more sophisticated attacks uh, where an attacker was combining different inputs and this uh, circumvention wasn't uh, enough. And this was finally fixed in Taproot, Segwit version one, where all inputs signatures are committing to all amounts of the transaction. And this means that if an attacker is lying in any of the inputs, then all of the signatures will not match because uh, this uh, rule is broken. Uh, this means we don't have to provide previous transactions to a hardware wallet, which makes signing uh, a lot, a lot faster, especially if you are spending uh, big transactions such as uh, pool payout or coin join. Uh, that uh, was uh, quite a big, uh, big hassle because a lot of, a lot of input, uh, uh, a lot of inputs in the transaction and. Uh, This was not a security concern because we were streaming these inputs, but it was a major user experience hassle because uh, the signing of uh, complex transactions took quite a long, long time and we we've, were able to fix that with uh, Taproot. There are also some other advantages for, uh, for example, for Conjoin. Maybe, maybe where May I ask you a question? I didn't know about this this problem. I'm quite interested in, in the details. Do you need, uh, or what do you need from other entities to uh, like this work? For example, you mentioned pool outputs. Uh, do you need that the transaction made by pool is uh, is a taproot transaction, or is it automatic that you you, you can somehow 
uh, benefit from this uh, this soft fork activated and nobody else can do a thing uh, it's automatic if uh, all inputs we spend uh, there are top root then we don't have to ask for any previous transactions so we okay. are directly benefiting from the upgrade Right, so for me, the most exciting thing about Taproot in hardware wallets is the ability to finally perform coin joins straight from the hardware wallet and straight into the hardware wallet so that both inputs and outputs never leave the Trezor, basically. Uh, and this would have been pretty much impractical and uh, undoable before Taproot. This is why in Trezor Suite, coin join will be only possible uh, with taproot addresses, not with uh, the original, the version zero segwit. Uh, because as Stick said, we don't have to stream uh, the transactional history, which would uh, be very large with uh, coin join outputs. So taproot basically makes coin join in hardware where it's possible finally. So this is very exciting. And uh, before we proceed to the details, oh, because I, I have some questions, <laughs> some questions about the new type address that Taproot, uh, Taproot brings, pay to Taproot, about the anonymity sets. Uh, Dan explained it pretty perfectly in his uh, in his article. Uh, we will post under the, the the announcement of this Twitter Spaces the reference to the, the link to, to, to this article for the reference. Uh, but I wanted to concentrate a little bit on the um, uh, signaling process and the long process of excavation because it's been uh, it's been around half year or more than half year since uh, the first signal uh, until the until the taproot was activated. Uh, maybe you guys can spread some light on this process, how it's an all um, how it's all organized and arranged, because um, I believe there are several misleadings about the signaling process. That is, it doesn't actually require changing the version of Bitcoin Core that you are running, um, and so on and so on. So, could you please uh, elaborate a little bit a little bit on that? Uh, yeah, of course. Um, without going into too much details, uh, it is pretty obvious that if you want a uh, Bitcoin network to support new functionality, you, you need to upgrade the software running the network. It's quite obvious. And there is a mechanism of uh, signaling readiness uh, from uh, the mining nodes uh, about being ready to correctly understand uh, the new version of the rules. And um, Taproot being soft fork uh, makes everything much easier. So the, the process is simpler than in, in case of uh, possible hard fork. But there still needs to be some synchronization between the entities and the network. So uh, the mechanism uses uh, a bit, bit mask in a Bitcoin block header, uh, basically saying, hey, I'm ready for uh, this kind of upgrade as a miner. So whoever produces blocks can signal this readiness um, it, it is not re directly related to the version of the software you're running uh, it is it can be done independently uh, and typically pools do it independently but what it means is uh, it's just saying hey we can properly understand the transactions so that if the network switches to the to, to the new uh, rule set uh, we can uh, securely uh, mine new blocks, uh, which would be, uh, yeah, let, let's not put uh, too much details in, in, in this. Um, so it, this, this process was done uh, several times before. Uh, guys were mentioning uh, SegWit, uh, so it's basically a known procedure. Um, and yeah, it, it takes some time before uh, the network generates the consensus and once the miners signal that uh, they are ready and, and the, the threshold was 90% uh, of hashing, hashing power supporting the change, 
measured by number of blocks in in signaling period. So one, once the result was was reached, uh, we could commit as a, as a network. We could commit to actually uh, starting to use the new rules. Uh, and there there is a need for some uh, period before it is agreed by miners or by readiness of miners uh, before the actual activation to get everybody some time to prepare the infrastructure and so on. But the commitment was done automatically but, uh, by mining the, the blocks with the proper, uh, proper bit signals. And was there any difference um, uh, in for for slash pool in signing for tap roots uh, versus uh, years ago uh, it, with the signing to Segwit? Yeah, it was, but it was not technically. Technically, it was basically the same thing, uh, but like politically, it is a completely different story. Uh, Segwit was very contentious upgrade, so what we did was uh, letting people. Uh, our miners, our clients, to pick what version of block they would like to mine. And we uh, served their miners the version of the block with the proper uh, header as they choose. Uh, basically transferring the the voting power to our clients and not uh, deciding uh, uh, for them what kind of uh, upgrade the, the network should take. But in this case, in Taproot's case, it was very simple there. We, we didn't detect any disagreement or like it, it was politically completely uh, okay. So we just decided to uh, set the flag uh, for the whole pool without uh, any like transitional or any, any voting of our, our clients and nobody objected. So from this perspective, it was a very different uh, procedure, but technically uh, very similar. You just uh, take a uh, it is called a block template from Bitcoin D. Uh, it's a source for a new block, not yet completed block because there needs to be some hashing, obviously. So we take this uh, template and change uh, uh, the headers, the bits, and serve it to miners. So whenever there is a new block found by the pool, uh, the, the new block will uh, contain the proper proper header. But you can do it with any version of uh, Bitcoin D. So we upgraded. Uh, to the new uh, Bitcoin version uh, much later than we started signaling. May I ask a question? Uh, how do you anticipate the future uh, SegWit upgrades? Like, obviously, there will be SegWit version 2. Uh, do you think there will be uh, the similar situation as with SegWit version 1, that it would be so smooth and straightforward when it comes to signaling and mining perspective? I think it's going to be smooth. It, it, it obviously depends on the topic, uh, but what we understand uh, like from dealing with miners, uh, they are more and more aligned with uh, the community in the sense that uh, what is good for Bitcoin in general, it is good for miners. Because at the end, most of the miners we know are Bitcoiners or Bitcoin holders or hodlers, whatever you prefer. So I don't expect uh, any any like strange uh, strong politics about signaling. Everybody basically understands that this is a good thing to uh, implement new features, getting better security, better privacy, and so on and so on. It helps Bitcoin. So uh, I would hope that uh, political games as SegWit are uh, in the past. That's definitely nice to hear. Thanks. Yes. Uh, also, also when they said it sounds soothing and promising. Um, hope, hope, it, hope, I hope that it's true, though. I hope and, as well. <laughs> <laughs> um, and getting back uh, to the taproot itself and the technical details, uh, it introduces a new type of addresses, uh, pay to taproot address. Uh, can you maybe mm, explain what's what's the new in this in this in this concept, and uh, what are the uh, specifics for inputs and outputs? I think I can start. Uh, so, 
As, as it has been said, uh, Taproot is uh, version one of uh, Segwit upgrade, and uh, so far the change in the address format is not that that big as it has been uh, with the Segwit version zero addresses. So what, what happens there is that the address still encodes the script, and the only change in the script was that the first byte, which used to indicate version zero, now indicates version one, and then the script uh, contained uh, the hash of the public key, which was 20 bytes, and now it uh, contains uh, public key itself, which is 32 bytes. So all in all, uh, addresses now encode uh, 12 bytes more of data. That also means they are a little bit longer. And uh, since SegWit addresses always start with BC1 for uh, Bitcoin, which is like a prefix, and uh, the bytes following the BC1 are encoding the data itself. And because the all addresses uh, for SegWit version zero had zero byte following uh, following it, uh, it, this translated to prefix uh, BC1Q, while the taproot addresses, because they encode uh, version one uh, immediately at the beginning of the script, this translates to BC1P. So if you see an address starting with BCIQ, it's uh, segwit version zero. If you see an address that's starting BCI, BC1P, then it's a segwit version one, aka taproot. If there will be segwit version two and others, and I hope there will be, uh, I think for segwit version two, the address will start with BC1Z because there will be version two at the beginning of the script. Because we are encoding more data than the addresses itself are longer, so regular Bitcoin uh, addresses for Segwit version zero, and by regular I mean single sig, were I think forty two characters long, and uh, because they encoded only the twenty bytes of uh, pubkey hash, and for Segwit version one you are encoding thirty two bytes of pubkey that translates to a longer address, which is sixty two bytes. Coincidentally, with Segwit version zero, if you were using multisig, it also uh, had this longer format because it was also encoding 32 bytes. So, yeah, uh, if if you if you look at the addresses, the Segwit version one addresses are around 50 percent longer, and this this cost us a lot of a lot of. Uh, trouble when we were trying to fit these very long addresses uh, on the Trezor display, but we we managed to, to do it. So we are uh, happy that we can show you the whole address on the on the device and we don't have to split it into several several screens. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you for that. I would add that uh... The new address type uh, may cause some compatibility headaches because it has to be actively implemented in order to be supported. So exchanges exchanges need to implement uh, SegWit v1 uh, or pay to taproot address type. Uh, otherwise, we won't be able to withdraw coins from exchanges or accept payments from other wallets that don't recognize this newer format. So uh, it may take some time uh, until these types of addresses are recognized by the broader Bitcoin ecosystem, as we saw with uh, Segwit v0 several, several years ago. Uh, and it took about two years before 50% of uh, Bitcoin payments were Segwit. So I'm not sure how long it will take uh, now. Curious about your thoughts maybe on that. I, I think it will take much less time this uh, this time because the, the reason why the new addresses are special is that uh, uh, Peter Wheeler and uh, Greg Maxwell discovered 
some flaw in the checksums that were introduced uh, with the batch 32 encoding of SegWit uh, version zero addresses. And they decided to tweak the checksum algorithm a little bit. Uh, so these con uh, collisions are not that uh, common. And this little tweak uh, was called back 32 m And it's literally just a change of uh, two constants. So what entities like exchanges and other wallets need to do is to add uh, this uh, extra feature into the address validators. So the address validator will be able to verify this new type of checksum as well. And this is uh, really, really trivial, but it will show which, uh, which entities, which wallets and which exchanges uh, re really want to be uh, supporting Bitcoin by uh, implementing this earlier or later. So let's let's hope uh, it will be it will be soon. But it's not uh, it's not a huge uh, a huge change to the infrastructure like we have seen uh, in the earlier Segwit update. Maybe maybe I can add there is a, as a list on a Bitcoin wiki which lists uh, uh, entities that support DEC32 and pay to uh, witness the older format and there is a new column in the table which uh, lists which entities do support pay to taproot and uh, receiving to taproot and so far there has been some progress but I expect most of the progress will happen during during next year. So hopefully soon uh, it will be pretty straightforward to people to use Taproot on their everyday use wallets. Thank you. Um, I wanted to move slightly to the anonymity part of Taproot, which is... Um, one of the elephants in the room, actually. Um, first, first, first to touch to touch the ground, uh, is there is anonymity is a big um, big topic for for miners and uh, what role does it play? Or it's uh, for for the mining industry and for miners in particular, it's uh, not something that is uh, playing its role um, if it's only for the end users. I would say it's not a, a particularly hot topic among miners, um, particularly institutional mining is more and more um, public. Like there are a lot of publicly traded mining companies now who, uh, even if anonymity features were available, probably wouldn't be able to use them just because of the nature of being public companies. Um, for a lot of the like pleb miners, as we call them, which I think there are, there are thousands of miners on Slush Pool who have maybe a couple of machines, like a, a couple of S9s running as space heaters, or they're hosting a few machines with a hosting provider. Um, for them, I think one of, at least for some of them, one of the big benefits of mining is getting sats from a mining pool, which is one hop away from the Coinbase transaction, as opposed to getting them from an exchange where they have to KYC. Um, so we we know of like a good amount of miners around the industry, not just with Slush Pool, who, uh, who like to send their payouts directly to, uh, to a, a wallet or do some coin join or something with them. And, and they take privacy very seriously from the very beginning. Uh, and a lot of those miners are, are mining even when they're not necessarily competitive. Um, not to say that they're not profitable, but, but certainly it's much more difficult for somebody to mine with a few S9s at their house than it is for a publicly traded company to raise millions of dollars and buy ASICs and, and run them really profitably with a um, industrial mining facility. So uh, there, there are definitely a lot of privacy-focused miners um, but in terms of the hash rate that they represent, it's probably a relatively small portion. Yeah, 
when when it comes to uh, chain blockchain analytics, uh, the good thing about uh, Taproot is that every Taproot use case uh, looks exactly the same when you look just at the address. And that's really nice because no matter if if your output uh, is uh, single seek, multi seek, it can be even a like general opening or general close. It will look the same on the blockchain. It will be a pay to taproot uh, output. The thing changes when you are spending uh, this uh, UTXO. Then you will basically reveal what kind of UTXO it was. But nevertheless, this is still fantastic news for hodlers because if you are uh, holding uh, your coins on UTXO for a long time, then basically no one can tell what type of UTXO it is. And even if you are spending uh, Taproot UTXOs, uh, for some use cases, it will provide an extra anonymity. And one of such uh, examples uh, is multisig. Earlier, when you were spending a multisig output, and for example, it was a three out of five multisig, you always had to reveal all five uh, public keys that were part of the scheme. And then you attach three of the signatures that uh, unlocked the multisig output. With Taproot, the good news is that you don't have to provide all five of these uh, keys used in the quorum. You provide only the keys that were responsible for that particular unlock. So in, in case of three out of five scheme, you provide just these three keys and nobody knows there were two uh, keys extra. What do you know? Maybe there were like 50 other keys extra. Nobody can tell uh, what what uh, is the complexity of your setup, how many keys are there. Maybe they are arranged in some complex uh, tree structure. You always reveal the minimum part of your setup that is uh, needed to prove you actually have rights to spend this UTXO. So also. this is uh, also very, very nice property of Taproot. And also many people expected uh, CSA, uh, if, I, if, I, if I call it correctly, cross simple signature aggregation and SegWit uh, version one. Uh, when in reality, the development will take at least one year, approximately, more or less. But could it slower the wide-scale adoption, though? And maybe uh, to elaborate on what is cross and signature aggregation, uh, why everybody was expecting it? Well... CISA cross input signature aggregation was an idea that was uh, suddenly possible when we switched to Schnorr signatures. And uh, Josef already indicated it earlier that Schnorr signatures have this really nice property that if you accumulate the, the public keys and if you accumulate the signatures, uh, then this accumulated or aggregated signature can uh, verify uh, verify the aggregated public key. Uh, that means that for every every transaction, you don't have to have uh, e one signature for each input. You suddenly can have an aggregated signature just uh, for one transaction as a whole. Uh, and that part was uh, excluded for Taproot because I, I'm i not sure I said it correctly, uh, but I think the reason was that there were small ways how to do it uh, correctly and the Bitcoin developers wanted to pick just the best version uh, of how to do it. So that's why this, uh, this cross-input signature aggregation was uh, delegated to one of the future upgrades. And the advantages are obvious. Uh, you are saving a lot of space uh, in the blockchain, especially if you are using uh, huge transactions. 
then uh, these huge transactions, when they have a lot of inputs, they have just one signature. And that is also incentivizing people to use conjoin because if you don't have to pay extra fees for a conjoin transaction, because there is just one signature, more people will do conjoin. So I'm also looking forward for that part to be implemented in one of the future. Uh, and hopefully it will be the next uh, SegWit uh, update. And since we touched the coin join, um, will like is that the correct assumption, or it's like the the reality? I might not be very uh, uh, very aware about it. But will taproot transactions be only supported by coin joins, since it's a perfect match, basically? Well, it it really depends on how you do coin joins. Uh, if you are just uh, a software wallet then it's uh, easy to implement uh, conjoin without uh, without taproot and there are a lot of implementations that do it uh, already but with a uh, hardware wallet it's uh, much much easier to implement conjoin uh, with uh, taproot uh, as uh, Joseph said uh, it's not impossible to do it without taproot but it's very very impractical and the reason is that uh, Trezor really doesn't uh, have like a full knowledge of what is happening around it. And uh, it can't see directly into the blockchain and it can't really see the other participants of the conjoin. So uh, with this extra... Uh, ex extra feature of Taproot that uh, each uh, signer is committing to all inputs, you are suddenly eliminating a lot of uh, not only theoretical but a lot of practical attacks against uh, hardware wallet participating in the conjoin. So that's, uh, that's a huge advantage. And as I said, it's not impossible, but it's highly impractical uh, without taproot and with taproot it's very suddenly it's very very simple because all of the signers are committing to the correct uh, amounts in the inputs thanks that's that that clarifies it and I want to move uh, slightly towards uh, the mining section, mining um, uh, part of Taproot again, uh, and address the question, next qu question to Pavel and Daniel. Uh, it's a bit um, out of scope what, what has been discussed in the last 10 minutes, uh, but still, I'm curious if uh, miners make any decisions about which pools to mine uh, with based on who was the signaling, for example, going back to the signaling. Is, there, is it some sort of, um, uh, let's say, either uh, democracy to it or like a free choice of... Um, of I of think the, the first pool to signal, we saw on Twitter a lot of like general Bitcoiners telling people switch your hash over to slush pool because they're supporting Taproot. Um, but the, the end result, was if there was any switch happening, it was not noticeable. And I think part of that is because everybody was expecting that um, all the other pools would eventually follow suit. It was like we, we had difficulty epochs available for it to happen. And um, I think it got signaled and approved in the third or fourth one. So it was never particularly concerning. Um, maybe if we had reached some like the sixth difficulty epoch, some people would have actually made some decision about which pool based on signaling support or not. But um, it definitely didn't happen, at least any with any hash rate that we're aware of uh, in this case. And I don't think most miners have like very long standing relationships with their with their mining pool. So they're not going to just up and leave about something like that uh, unless the situation gets desperate, like I said.
Thanks. And another question. Um, assuming all pools updated to a version of Bitcoin Core that supports Taproot, why were some pools mining Taproot transactions immediately uh, start mining and uh, after activation and other weren't? <laughs> yeah, it's funny. Uh, I partially uh, opened uh, the reason before in one of the answers, but uh, you as a pool uh, don't have to actually run Bitcoin Core or any other Bitcoin client with full support of uh, Taproot for making the signaling. The, the signaling is really just a one particle bit set to one instead of zero. And you can, if you, if you do this modification in your, uh, in your pool code, uh, you can signal for Taproot. Uh, but for mining uh, Taproot transactions, um, you have to have full support. So what is my expectation? I, I don't know about uh, any pool uh, from uh, the mentioned set. I didn't talk about uh, this with any of the, of the pools, but I assume they just signaled because they wanted to signal, but uh, they didn't switch the infrastructure to new Bitcoin D version in time. And I, kind of, I, I can understand why it can happen. It, it's not necessarily a simple, uh, simple task. Uh, to upgrade all infrastructure. Obviously, there is a lot of money going around and you don't want to mess with uh, something what works. Uh, and mining uh, nodes needs to be 100% time uptime. There needs to be always a, a valid connection to the uh, network and so on and so on. So there, there is a lot of technical stuff which needs to go correctly if you want to upgrade all your mining nodes and especially if it's if it, uh, related to uh, Bitcoin D. So the answer is simple. It is a technical task, and I guess there are other priorities for uh, the pool operators to do uh, b before getting into uh, the, the actual upgrade. But the signaling was uh, was necessary, and and it was done by by them as well. Like we di we didn't want to uh, get through the activation point without uh, running the proper nodes. So we were uh, doing it a few days before the actual activation, but it is some work and uh, it can take longer than one expects. Okay, so it's uh, more of a technical detail rather than uh, a conflict, let's say. This is my understanding. I don't think there was uh, any more into it. Uh, maybe I'm wrong, but I didn't get any indication of being it differently. Well, I hope you're not. No. I hope you're not wrong. Anyway. Yeah, I I really agree with Pavel that uh, when you are running a mining operation or exchange, you really want to be on the conservative side of things, and uh, maybe if if you if you have a if you have strong confidence in how your infrastructure is designed that means that it has uh, tests uh, everywhere then you are probably uh, less hesitant to deploy such update because you have t tested everything and i'm i'm not s implying that uh, the pools that have uh, joined the party later have uh, wrong uh, test or not enough tests but uh, of course the more tests you do the more uh, the more you can afford to to deploy stuff uh, into production earlier so i guess that there is some correlation at least yeah and it, it is not so, even only about testing like we, we for example run several tens of uh, mining nodes and every single of them needs to have 100 percent uptime to uh, the network. So there needs to be some Bitcoin D running as close as possible to the particular network node doing the mining. So if you if you want to upgrade the software, you need to have something else ready to take over the, the duty. So you don't want to do it <clears throat> as a one big swipe of deployment of a new version. It, it, ne it needs to be done uh, gradually so that your operation is not uh, negatively influenced. And this can take some time, especially if there are strict uh, security measures uh, for touching the core infrastructure in the particular company. 
So I would, I would assume technical complications or uh, being careful uh, more than any like possible political explanation or something. And e even testing doesn't necessarily help with, with the deployment procedure. A, a little bit of a tangent, but something else going on in the mining industry recently uh, around the same time that could potentially explain why some of the other pools haven't prioritized it is that um, Chinese pools who, who registered their domains in China with Alibaba or some other Chinese company, uh, recently the domains were put behind the Great Firewall. And I think Alibaba and other companies were instructed to uh, basically stop hosting those pool websites and stuff. So a, a lot of pools have been dealing with um, some more significant issues recently that would definitely take higher priority than if they hadn't done this yet in preparation for the activation, then um, I think these issues started happening with the China firewall and the, the more significant crackdown on mining pools right around the same time as the activation. Uh, so that could also explain it. So the China ban is a less of a thought for mining than for the rest of the Bitcoiners. So it's uh, actually a uh, sort of deal breaker or uh, something that uh, might change the perspective. It, it is a very major change. It's a very significant in the mining world. Like it influences so many things. Uh, probably more than uh, anybody from outside of the, uh, this part of the Bitcoin ecosystem can, can imagine. Uh, it has very profound consequences to the rest of the world. Uh, but it, it is a topic for, uh, for different discussion, I think, not really related to Taproot. But it, it's fascinating uh, part of the uh, Bitcoin and especially Bitcoin mining uh, history. Uh, but yet it can, uh, if I if I assume correctly, it can have the actual uh, implications. Uh, and to tie this topic with the taproot, uh, and this is an open question: What do you see as the future of taproot, and what is the what is the future after taproot? Giving effects every all, all the uh, short yet we have the history of the Bitcoin developments and um, all the upgrades of Bitcoin. No, I'm not sure uh, who is the target for uh, the question, but my perspective is, um, I think it will be it will be adopted pretty fast, which means two three years uh, in our in our world uh, there will be but quite strong political uh, I mean user based push towards uh, the services or uh, companies to provide. Uh, Taproot support uh, because the general consensus is it is a great thing for for Bitcoin and there is a condition for being useful and not being harmful and it is uh, large adoption or large enough adoption so and and we could uh, to a certain extent see it uh, for or during the activation process already it was a unanimous uh, thing basically it was not no battle or anything. So I guess even the adoption will be driven by a unanimous acceptance of, of this feature. So my guess is two, three years and uh, may, the huge majority of uh, companies will support it and, and majority of transactions would be approved. Yeah. Personally, I'm very curious about uh, the uptake of the root in Lightning management tools, because that's probably the lowest hanging fruit uh, in terms of advanced transaction types, because Lightning Network has been exploding in adoption this year. And uh, we all would like to save on some fees with channel openings and closings and uh, to be even more private with uh, these kind of thing, things. So I believe we will see the initial uptake and adoption in Lightning Network uh, tools. Uh, and as regards future of that route, um, I'm really looking forward to CISA, uh, 
across input signature aggregation, as we uh, talked about already, and uh, quite curious about how the process uh, of activation of the boot version 2 uh, will go about uh, when we will see some uh, initial bips and uh, how long it will take actually maybe maybe stick can chime in on this because he's probably the most familiar with uh, the bip process here well <laughs> i have to let you down i'm not really sure uh, what's what's the process uh, right now i can only assume this happens on on the mailing list uh, the, the bitcoin dev uh, mailing list but I can add maybe uh, to adoption question. I think this will be driven by projects such as exchanges, wallets, uh, software wallets and hardware wallets because people usually don't really care whether their uh, UTX or address is, is a top root or segwit. They want something that really works and by really works means that I can use it uh, without any hassle so uh, not only the receiver uh, has to understand taproot also the sender has to understand taproot so once the major players in the field will uh, implement it then uh, more and more players can have taproot addresses as default for example we are uh, shipping treasure suite uh, in with uh, uh, taproot uh, accounts in one week but we don't uh, default to taproot accounts yet because all of our users will have so much trouble uh, accepting coins to these addresses because uh, it will take take some time for the whole ecosystem to adapt but once uh, it is it, it is like a network uh, effect and once uh, ma the majority is supporting Taproot, then it's no brainer to default uh, to Taproot addresses as well. And you also mentioned uh, Lightning earlier. I think uh, this uh, will be a really nice improvement when Taproot uh, will be fully supported by, uh, by Lightning network nodes when opening and closing channels. But not only that, but uh, at the same time, in parallel, uh, I guess that the Lightning Network developers, they are adding new option where basically you could open the channel by using some external funding. So you can craft a transaction which uh, creates a Lightning Network connection between two nodes and fund it from a separate wallet and if this wallet uh, is an exchange or another wallet, then it's a huge win for privacy because then the sender wouldn't know they are actually funding a lightning channel and not sending to a particular Bitcoin address. So I'm really looking forward to this small pieces uh, of uh, improvements in various areas and they will suddenly click in one point in future and this is what i'm really excited that when this all these small improvements will come back together and create something very very nice yeah that's amazing i also believe taproot will bring about new use cases and uh, similar to segwit uh, and how lightning network came uh, because of SegWit, and we were expecting SegWit, but then uh, what we are seeing now, this past like six or nine months, is uh, like a third layer emerging on top of Lightning Network with Sphinx Chat, Podcasting 2.0, Impervious AI, and this is something nobody expected uh, like in 2017. So I believe similar things can happen with Stepwood where suddenly the complex spending conditions will become economical and we will see more of some kind of experimentation around that and uh, new use cases emerge. So, yeah, the, and like having the ability to fund a lightning channel from the exchange would be very cool, as you say. And 
And then do you want to share your perspective of the future of Taproot and future after Taproot? Um, I'd say these guys all covered it pretty well. And I've been uh, very much focused on mining since writing the Taproot article and, and the signaling stuff. So uh, I don't have anything special to add after all those good answers. Okay, thanks. Um, uh, I will get back to you shortly uh, with um, with a question referencing your your blog uh, with with, with uh, my colleagues from from Brains. My colleagues uh, on my position from Brains shared shared the thread uh, in the spaces uh, leading to the blog. So everybody uh, is more than welcome to check it out. Very good read. Um, but following the question about the future. Uh, quite the opposite one. What are the potential downfalls of taproots? For example, if adoption and support takes too long despite the signaling. And it's, if it's possible, I would also like to separate it for the, um, what are potential downfalls for miners and, and pools and uh, for uh, harbor wallet manufacturers and exchanges and end users. Well, uh, Taproot is a SegWit upgrade, and like any SegWit upgrade, uh, it's an opt-in. So you don't really have to use it, and still everything somehow works. And I think that Taproot already has some significant uh, improvements that might be beneficial for you uh, as as an as an user. So why not to why not to use it? So. Uh, I don't think there there is a chance that Taproot will fail or something like that. Maybe maybe the adoption rate wouldn't uh, go as fast as we wish for, but still people that are benefiting from this upgrade will use it. And one of such, as case, such cases was, like we mentioned, uh, the conjoin on hardware wallets or spending huge transactions uh, on hardware wallets uh, in general. So this is definitely going to be the case where Taproot will be used. And if, uh, if for example, exchanges will not adopt it because for whatever reason, then I would need to send my coins to, uh, an, uh, to a SegWit version zero address first and then to resend it uh, for, uh, due, uh, via internal transfer between two accounts and still benefit from Taproot. And of course, you can uh, you can vote with your wallets. Like if, if your exchange doesn't support Taproot and you want uh, to use it, then maybe you can switch to exchange this, that is more progressive and supports Taproot already. And is it a relevant question for uh, for miners? Uh, the potential downfalls of Taproot are there? Are, are they existing? I think only to, uh, miners being uh, Bitcoin users and Bitcoin hodlers. Uh, other than that, uh, I don't think there is any downfall. Uh, we briefly discussed the uh, like n not using the space uh, or using space efficiently by Taproot transactions. So if users are wasting space in the chain, then they are paying more fees. So it could be uh, beneficial for miners, like the complete opposite uh, argument could be made. But other than that, I don't think there is like anything mining specific why it, it would be good or bad. Thank you. Um, I also, uh, we are, uh, we have uh, more than one hour on clock. Uh, I would like to ask you if you want to, uh, if you're ready to uh, answer to a couple of more questions from me. And also, um, I'm asking our listeners to jump in if they want to. It's, it's, the, it's the right time right now. Uh, so if you guys are uh, ready to spend like 15, 20 more minutes with us. Um, signal the support yeah thank you dan <laughs> yeah sure go go ahead and ask 
while uh, while we're waiting, um, maybe, maybe our listeners are not very. Um, it seems like no, not 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 all the questions um, are in the line, uh, or better speaking, none questions are in the line. Uh, the following question, uh, the question following the one about the um, uh, future of Taproot and the potential downfalls. Uh, what is, when it comes for end users, uh, what is the main motivation to get to Taproot? Yeah, um, so in the short term, I would say those already using multisix um, will probably benefit the most because they will enjoy the cheaper fees and increased privacy, uh, while in the short term, the privacy won't be uh, a result of hiding in the crowd because the taproot transactions will sort of stand out if there are not many, uh, but still they won't have to reveal like uh, the full scheme, so the privacy benefits will be there. And uh, in a, a little longer short term, uh, there will be come the ability to perform uh, coin joins uh, straight from Trezor Suite, but it will take a, a few few more months for us to implement uh, coin control and uh, coin join. Uh, and in the long term, we will see even, uh, even more privacy benefits because uh, basically all the taproot transactions look the same. So you won't be able to tell apart uh, multisigs from uh, Lightning Network channel management. Uh, and if the uptake is sufficient, you will sort of hide in the crowd. And is there any more to this uh, on the in initial stage? Um, or it's... Um let's say, a long evolving process that requires time and patience. And uh, for now, uh, it is like nothing more for the end users is on the table. Yeah, it's sort of similar to uh, the original SegWit, where in the initial months, uh, you wouldn't see that, that many benefits because uh, if you sent your coins to SegWit address, uh, the support simply wasn't there, so you, you wouldn't be able to do much. Hopefully, this will be uh, a faster process this time. As Stick uh, outlined, it's not a huge technical problem to implement the boot addresses, but uh, it's sort of a chicken and egg problem. Uh, you, will, you will see the main benefits once the uptake is high enough but it will take some time. And uh, as Pavel mentioned, it may take like two years before we see that. Thank you. And um, to continue on the same question, um, there is a concept uh, I'm not sure. But I cannot. I, I can be wrong calling it concept, but um, uh, when it comes to uh, time of adoption and uh, the the how much the number of uh, end users matters, uh, there is an uh, anonymity set. And uh, Daniel, you ex explain it very well in your article. May I ask you to uh, briefly introduce the anonymity sets concept within the taproot and uh, what it is and uh, why the thresholds when it comes to an image set matters in these regards. Yeah, sure. So um, before writing that article, we were contacted about like why we shouldn't support Taproot and stuff. And we, we didn't really um, take it seriously, but, but we saw it as an opportunity to educate ourselves and then share what we learned. And uh, Christian, our marketing manager, happened to have some connections where we were able to talk to people working on chain analysis projects and um, ask them like, what what is the actual impact of how does this make your jobs harder or easier? And uh, the the critical topic that came from that was the anonymity set. And basically, what that is is that like these um, chain analysis firms use heuristics to group together or cluster together 
different types of behavior on chain or different types of addresses on chain or, or what have you. Uh, and, and these can be called anonymity sets. They're like clusters of behavior or addresses that have things in common. And, um, one of the things that, that can be used, one of the heuristics that can be used to cluster addresses is the type of address that it is. So the, uh, the impact there with Taproot is that when it's first adopted and people begin to use the pay to Taproot addresses, there's only a few of those that have been used on chain and therefore they're very easily distinguishable from all the other different types of addresses that are being used. Uh, so this is creating a, a super small anonymity set in the initial stages where, uh, yes, you get some privacy benefits from um, doing more complicated things without exposing what complicated things you're doing. Uh, but at the same time, you're putting yourself into a very small group of people who are also doing that. So you're kind of shining a spotlight on yourself. Um, and as as uh, Joseph and Pavel were both talking about before, uh, as more people use it, uh, that an, an anonymity set grows as more people have uh, transactions sent to pay to taproot addresses, um, then there's a larger group that you can hide in. And that's basically what an, an anonymity set is, is like uh, if there's only four or five people that are as like this is different from everybody else, so we can uh, we can hone in on it. And when there are millions and millions of, of people using the same type of address, then it becomes difficult to, uh, to hone in on much more. So the critical thing with, uh, with Taproot for the anonymity set to be, uh, to turn from a privacy negative into a privacy positive is simply adoption. The more people are using it, the larger the anonymity set grows and the, uh, the more private it becomes for everybody who's doing it. And uh, can we uh, think of a response to the open questions that you outlined in the blog, uh, which is that, uh, what adoption threshold will the taproot anonymity set be sufficiently large and enough for users to have a net benefit of their privacy? Or it's still an open one? I mean, too early, but if we fantasize. Yeah, very much open from my perspective. I have pretty little idea. Yeah, like from philosophical point of view, like if you want to hide in the crowd, it's better if the crowd is already a majority because if it's a minor crowd, then it's it's not. There's no point in hiding in that crowd. So, uh, just from philosophical point of view, I think that it starts making sense if 50% of transactions are taproot transactions or 50% of newly created uh, UTXOs are taproot. And I think we are on, on a pretty good way. Like the, the major hardware wallets already support taproot and this is just the, the beginning. And, uh, uh, we Hopefully we will see more parties uh, joining us uh, later. So, yeah. I think we will reach uh, 50% in the following week, uh, sorry, in the, in the following year. I think it is much less than 50% actually, because uh, there are different, other different uh, features of transaction which, which, can, which you can use for clustering them. And top rule transactions, if we assume that most of them will go the default route uh, and distinguishable from uh, a single uh, simple transaction and they, they are v really very the same but if you go to the other side the other types of transactions there is still some distinguishing factors uh, so the clustering uh, can be done based on different stuff than only the uh, transaction type so I would I would guess I, I don't have the numbers but it, it it feels to me that it needs to be much less than 50% to be uh, the best uh, crowd to be uh, hiding in. So our job now, or quote unquote job, is to keep on discussing uh, the pros, the perks and benefits of Taproot and just um, 
actively waiting for uh, more people, uh, more um, entities to get to get on board and um, go to the moon. Then I think it's a nice time. Yeah, sorry, 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 stick. Yeah, I just wanted to add that uh, there are a lot of lot of areas where we can't do anything else than just educating people what's what's good for uh, for the whole community and what's good uh, good for them and it is not only about the top route but about uh, everything basically so we need to keep uh, educating uh, people if if you if you feel that you have uh, things to say then they just don't just keep them to ourselves but uh, educate people around you and uh, it's hard sometimes because the the concepts that we are dealing with are uh, pretty complex but i think if you think a little bit about it then they can be simplified in layman's terms and explained to to people who are just joining uh, the bitcoin community who haven't been in the community since the, the beginning like we were Can't agree more. Uh, thank you guys very much for the talk. Uh, I, it, for me, it was very interesting. Uh, a, a little bit hectic, uh, but in a good way. Um, if you want to add something for the conclusion, um, a lot of topics were discussed. Um, it's still not the end. Uh, I hope we'll have more talks like that in the future with more details and more context. Um, so if, if you guys want to add something, I'll give you some space for it. Uh, and on my end, want to thank you for coming. Thank you to our listeners to join uh, and be with us right now. Uh, it was Matvey. Always nice to hear you. Uh, thank you for uh, making this space happen. I think it's a very interesting topic. We covered a lot of uh, even technical stuff and high-level stuff. Uh, thanks for uh, making this happen and related to Taproot um, I'm very grateful for how smooth the whole process went and I really wish uh, that it will be the same in the future as well because Bitcoin will need a new innovation and uh, deploying stuff in the wild so people can use it and improve the uh, experience with the technology and this is a great sign from my perspective that it, it can be done in a co cooperative and uh, uh, like great way forward quite fast. So it, it is a great sign. Uh, cheers. Let's do other good stuff in Bitcoin space. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, everyone, for joining us, uh, Matvey for organizing, and uh, Josef, Pavel, and Daniel for joining me. It was very nice to reconnect with uh, you guys uh, in these crazy times, at least uh, virtually, and hopefully that we'll uh, have another great discussion soon. Thank you, and bye-bye. Yeah, seconding what Pavel said. Thanks a lot for putting this on. It was a lot of fun. I uh, hope to do it again. Then it's inevitable. Thank you and uh, wish you a good evening, day, morning uh, and hope to hear you all again. Thank you, guys. It was a great talk. Ciao, ciao. Bye. Goodbye.